we are back for another coffee session and you would not believe it but we managed to get mr jeremy howard himself on to the coffee session this is a huge episode and vishnu and i i don't even have a coffee i don't know (laughs) yeah that's it's not a prerequisite and no but now i want one you shouldn't have mentioned it and i'm like oh no i haven't had my coffee it's only 7 a.m here I know you are in a position. You, I think you are the only one out of both of us, yeah. or all three of us, that should be drinking coffee. I'm sitting at 12 o'clock a.m. right now. Vishnu's uh, also late. But you're in the morning. You could be having the coffee. We're calling in from undisclosed locations. Well, actually, no. I'll say my location. I am in Andros, Greece, at the Andrion Club, which is why it looks like i'm at a speakeasy (laughs) and you may or may not hear music that sounds so classy is that as classy as it sounds yeah yeah it's the social club here on the island and it is incredible i've got amazing friends who are letting me use it for this because my wife and child are sleeping back at our our place and so that's it anyway we came to talk to you jeremy today about so many different things because you, as we were mentioning, you make ripples in the MLOps community. And when you speak, people tend to retweet or just port your tweets over to Slack. And as it is, a lot of people in our feedback form ask that we get you on here. And so we did it. We, I, I consider this a huge success because we were able to, to get you on here and now I'm excited to talk to you. I think it would be probably really good for those two people out there listening that do not know who you are, if we could get a little background on who you are and what you do. Uh, sure. Uh, I'm co-founder of Fast.ai, which is a research, teaching, and development lab that focuses on making deep learning more accessible. And I've got a bit of a mixed background of um, starting various startups and doing a lot of work around ML and analytics. And in my long distant past, I was uh, I spent nearly 10 years working in business strategy. It's got to be one of the most modest introductions we've had uh, on the on the on the podcast in a long time. But I'll let you slide because it must be tiring to do the same thing. Um, many of you will have you may have used the Fast AI uh, framework, have may have taken the courses, um, or have benefited from its great blog posts. Uh, thank you, Jeremy, for for being the founder of that and 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 for being a proponent of 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 of, of you know just democratizing the deep learning world. My um, pleasure. You know. Just to kind of kick things off, um, you know, what some of the things that you've been working on lately with NB Dev, Fast AI, uh, a lot of it is just related to this idea of workflow and how we build machine learning models. Um, you know, in the community, we talk a lot about what happens to those models after they're built, but you're spending a lot of time helping people build those models better and take, you know, um, take, take the best practices into consideration as they build those models. My question to you to kick things off is, how did you kind of get interested in workflow tool development and what catalyzed you to actually write the first lines of code for the Fast AI package? Um, they're two somewhat separate things. <clears throat> um, my interest in workflow comes from my um, extreme laziness. So I don't want to I want to write as little code as possible, and I want to write it as few times as possible, and I want to spend as little time as possible debugging, and I want to spend as little time as possible going back and figuring out why I did something six months ago or a year ago or whatever. So, um, you know, I found um, my tools make a huge difference to that. And um, in particular, I find kind of being cognizant of my human foibles helps a great deal when it comes to setting up and creating tools. Um, so, you know, like all humans, I'm, I'm forgetful, I'm impatient, um, but I'm also highly visual. 
um, <clears throat> I uh, like to experiment. I can't remember everything all the time. So, um, you know, the, the I've been coding for, I mean, I, I first coded 40 years ago, you know, when I was seven, and I've been coding pretty much every day for 30 years. Um, and most of that time I've been in editors and IDEs and stuff where, um, I don't know, I was always struggling to find this kind of iterative experimental approach where I can like figure out the answer gradually. And as I do so, it becomes the the software artifact I'm trying to build. And so I did, you know, I did, I, I was very into TDD, um, um, test driven development, and that helped quite a bit. And, you know, having a quick feedback cycle there, but um, it was really notebooks, which made a big difference to me. Like that was the biggest thing in my life in terms of productivity of, of really like treating me as a, as a human being that, that needs to experiment, that needs to explore, but also that needs to like, I'm a real big believer in the scientific process, mm. you know, and the best scientists in history have always been um, brilliant journalists. You know, they create fantastic, thoughtful, careful journals. And, and as computer programmers, we we have a culture of throwing away all the stuff of experimenting and iterating that we do. People want to have like a, a line oriented REPL or a scratch pad or something. And I'm like, no, that's, that's terrible. That's like, you know, figuring out all this cool stuff and then throwing it away and just showing the answer. It's like, you know, writing Fermat's last theorem in the margin and ignoring how you got there. So, um, yeah, so all these things kind of lead me to want to kind of build build workflows on top of, you know, really visual iterative exploratory things. And notebooks is the best thing we have for that. So that's that's kind of where NB Dev comes from. Um, and actually that goes back decades. I used to be a big fan of Mathematica. At least I used to be a big fan of the Mathematica notebook interface. Um, not really a big fan of the proprietary nature of the language. For sure, yeah, um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And then... So that's kind of like, I mean, it's not just NB Dev, it's lots of stuff I've done, like a lot of it you wouldn't even probably be aware of, like for working with EC2 AWS instances, I created something called Fast EC2, which again, it gives you a REPL, which you can like tab complete stuff and explore the API, and you can even use use it in a notebook directly. Um, you know, I just kind of try to create lots of tooling, basically for myself, I try to create things for myself that just make it easier to explore and experiment and iterate. Um, fast AI is uh, a bit, well, it's quite different to that because it's not something which is about improving workflows so much. It's about um, providing a number of layers of abstraction which um, machine learning practitioners can use to, to build, test, deploy, maintain models. Um, and and so that was really about a couple of things. Um, the first was just when PyTorch pre-release first came out, I was just like, okay, this is such a much better experience than TensorFlow. Um, I want to embrace this, you know. But then, and so originally I did that uh, basically. PyTorch came out a few days, but you released came out a few days before part two of our first course came out. Uh, or maybe it's the second course. Anyway, part two of a course came out. And I literally rewrote the entire course from scratch to use PyTorch as soon as it came out. Because I just thought, okay, this is just so much better, particularly for part two, where it's all about exploring the cutting edge of research and reading and implementing papers and stuff. I was like, okay, we can now what you'd now, nowadays would call it, I guess, greedy, um, you know, or, um, you know, uh, kind of a, a greedy evaluation or whatever. Um, yeah, it lets you, it lets you do all the stuff I love, you know, debug and iterate and, and write normal Python code in normal Python ways. Um, and that was fine for part two of the course, but it was never going to fly for part one of the course, you know, which I, needed to do a new part one six months later because it was a whole lot of boilerplate, 
you know, a whole lot of um, write your own training loop and write your own scheduler and annealing and everything. Um, and so, you know, I'd always been using Keras um, previously, originally with Theano and then with TensorFlow. Um, and that really let us get rid of a lot of that boilerplate. Um, so there was a real immediate need, which was, okay, I want to embrace PyTorch, but we can't embrace PyTorch on its own, so we have to create something Keras-like for PyTorch. Um, and nothing existed at that time. Um, but then I thought, well, we could go further, because one of the things that bothered me about Keras was it only really operated well at one level of abstraction, which was the kind of the 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 Keras API it, it gave you. And I didn't like that meant it, it was very often hard to it was hard to kind of use in our own research, you know, because it didn't really it wasn't really that hackable. Um, it was hard to show students how to like dig deeper and deeper, because again it wasn't really that hackable. Um, you know, there was a lot of, just so often we just had to throw a lot of Keras cool stuff away and use TensorFlow or whatever directly because it just didn't support what we wanted to do. So, so the other thing I kind of thought is, okay, well, let's create like, you know, something like Keras, but, but much more hackable, much more kind of researcher friendly, you know, allowing really deep kind of, um, you know, changes to every part of the code. But let's do it in a way that's like based on really rigorous software engineering principles, because that's the other thing I found in a lot of machine learning libraries that the kind of stuff that software engineers take as bread and butter didn't exist. Um, you know, so make sure things are really well decoupled and really well layered and stuff like that. So that's kind of, yeah, that's really where fast AI came from. That was, uh, <laughs> was like the exact answer I was looking for. I feel like I actually got to understand a little bit your thought process and, 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 you know, those mentions of Theano and, and cafe and everything. I kind of get where you're coming from. And I don't know who it was. Maybe it was Bill Gates, I think, who said, uh, Whenever I have a hard problem, I try to hire a lazy person. Um, yes, because he did say I think that. it's Bill Gates. Yeah, and uh, Larry Wall said laziness is one of the three virtues of a great programmer, along with impatience and hubris. <laughs> I definitely believe that. I definitely believe that. Although I don't know if I really want to admit to having all three. Uh, <laughs> I'll leave that to you, Demetrius. You're gonna have to tell me. Um, I. Uh, I think there's one thing in your answer that I really want to kind of hone in on, and that's this like layers of abstraction point. Um, because I think it's something that, you know, I'll be honest, I think it's a word or a phrase that's used a lot. Maybe people don't really understand how it goes into decision making and how to like really systematically think about it. And the reason I bring that up is because in our community, something we talk a lot about is this idea of like platform development or enablement, right? Which is we have a lot of software engineers in the group have a lot of data scientists and machine learning scientists, and each side is trying to think about, okay, how do we create a company-wide platform that allows you know, data scientists to build models quicker and allows software engineers to build, to put those models into production more quickly, right? And that's a, that's a problem that calls for abstractions, that calls for, as Todd Underwood, one of our previous guests puts it, you know, drawing boxes around different steps. So, you know, I guess my question to you is, how do you go about, you know, thinking about, I guess, abstraction in the context of software engineering? Like what has been maybe useful resources for you or, or how did you think about it as you developed, you know, fast AI um, with the right level of abstraction that you wanted compared to something like Keras? Um, I mean, over the last few decades, I've done a lot of reading about API design and about APIs I admire. Um, so, for example, the .NET API, you know, .NET being built by the brilliant, uh, or led by the brilliant Anders Herzberg of, uh, of uh, TypeScript fame and Turbo Pascal fame, C Sharp fame. Um, you know, there's a fantastic um, uh, book about the kind of .NET API design 
foundations, which is really useful. Obviously, the, the, the Apple human interface guidelines have a lot of interesting stuff. Um, so, I mean, I've just, I, sp I spent a lot of time studying API design, um, uh, you know, and with APIs that I, I uh, that I admire. Um, and then when it comes to building them, with, with fast AI, it was a case of being, you know, almost ridiculously obsessive, like um, about just rewriting it again and again and again. So the data blocks API went through 25 rewrites, um, which drives anybody I work with crazy that I, you know, you know, 24 times out of 25, wherever we get to, I say, no, that's not good enough. Um, and it's kind of like, I just keep trying until, until we get to a point where I'm like, this is, this is the best that I can do. You know, I can't think of any way to make it better. And so, so you talked about layers. So layers are different to boxes, right? It's not just about drawing boxes around things, but layers are things that you build on top of. And then you build other things on top of those and you build other things on top of those. And human civilization and human scientific development is all about building on top of layers of abstraction. You know, if you think about the, the world of math and the world of physics, it, it, it comes from, you know, kind of have arithmetic operations and then you have, you know, powers on top of that and then you expand things to handle non-integers and then you, and like, you know, it, it, as you learn more math, you build more math on top of that and ditto with physics and ditto with computer science. Um, we should endeavor to do the same thing with our APIs, right? It's like if each time you create another layer of your API, you let people think deeper and go further. Um, but also make it easy for them to, to, to go into the lower levels of the API. But it's really important that you can go into the lower levels of the API and just change a little bit, not have to like replace that entire foundation if you want to change things. So, you know, the way I think about it, it's a bit like thinking about the way kind of AWS did their kind of surface architecture. It's like, okay, we're going to have well-defined interface boundaries and everybody in Amazon has to talk to each other through these interface boundaries. And, you know, um, you make sure that the whole thing works together because that's everybody has to use that system. So, you know, I make sure all of my mid-tier APIs are built using my low-tier APIs and then all of my high-tier APIs are built using my mid-tier APIs. And, you know, so I'm, I'm my own customer. And if I'm ever like, oh, this is annoying to do with my mid-tier API, I'm going to have to drop back into the low-tier API or even do into plain PyTorch. And I'm like, okay, well, that suggests that my mid-tier API isn't as flexible as it needs to be or whatever. So, um, yeah, having, having the layers built on top of each other, I find, um, you know, forces me to, to provide a, a layered API, which developers are going to end up enjoying using because I'm enjoying using it. Yeah, there's again a lot to a lot to parse in what you just shared. Um, you know, I think the point that you made about rewrites, I I I, I totally see how that can be, um, you know, part of that creative journey. I think of software engineering because it is creative. It is creative. Um, you know writing code programming uh, is looking back yeah at it's like i mean you know if you're if you admire t.s Eliot's poetry you know it doesn't he didn't just write his poems he rewrote them dozens or hundreds of times it's like that's the thing that people i think often don't realize is people think like they see some work they really admire and they're like oh this is a work of genius and the, but when you actually look at somebody building it, it's like no that's a work of <laughs> You know, just, just loads of hours of working yeah. really hard. <laughs> Saying this isn't good enough a hundred times. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I think I, I do think that is one of the things regrettably that, you know, gets lost at companies, right? You know, if you said I need to do a rewrite to a product manager or even to an engineering manager or something, they'd just be like, well, why did you write it well the first time? You know, and I think <laughs> uh, that <laughs> that's always that's always kind of the creative tension we have to deal with. Um 
you know, the the one particular thing I wanted to ask you or, or go deeper with you on is, you know, you mentioned you've read about API design, you've had this almost historical perspective in the sense of like how, you know, some of the most fundamental APIs or some of the most you know, time-tested APIs have, 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 have you know, um, stayed relevant. Um, but the, the really unique thing I find about fast AI, um, you know, as somebody that's played around with it has been that so many different kinds of programmers can come and, you know, use it very effectively. Right. Um, but, you know, you are obviously a much better than average software engineer. And so, you know, you, 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 you're telling me that, you know, you've developed yourself. And I certainly see that from the standpoint of kind of, you know, taking a different perspective than some of the, some of the other frameworks. But how do you balance what you find to be maybe elegant or useful with, I guess, what you found, which is that a lot of people find it really easy to use and, and use it? Well, yeah, I mean, I've been coding a lot longer than most people, right? So, so I, I can often figure things out a bit more quickly than people who haven't been coding so long or whatever, or as much. Um, but still, the difference between a kind of a smooth, clear interface and a clunky interface is still going to slow me down, you know. Um, so the kind of stuff that makes it easy to use for a beginner, it's going to make it easy to use for me as well, particularly because I can't keep the whole thing in my head, right? So if I haven't done... So there are still parts of the library that I, I have to spend quite a lot of time reminding myself about before I start working on them and they're the bits of the library where I'm like okay these aren't good enough yet because it's still too still too complicated so if it takes me a long time to kind of page in the concepts and things I need to know to start hacking on a part of the library that you know that's the same stuff that's going to cause other people to find it um, difficult to get started with um, and also just stuff like you know error messages and stack tracing and debuggability and and you know, one of the big things for everybody, regardless of, of expertise level, is consistency of API. You know, so like the fact that the high the high high level API for fast AI, you write basically the same code to do tabular, to do collaborative filtering, to do vision, to do NLP. It's just less overhead for our brains to have to um, think about. Uh, so yeah, I don't, I, you know, I, I generally find there is not a qualitatively different kind of stuff you have to do to to be helpful to an expert versus helpful to a beginner. So I'm wondering when you're on this constant quest for optimization and making things the best that it can be, do you have a moment where you've realized maybe in trying to optimize or trying to be more efficient, you have made things more inefficient? Yeah, all the time. <laughs> and you know, that, that might be kind of versions 11 through 23. <laughs> you know, it's like, um, you know, there's always a, there's always a compromise in abstracting something, right? Because when you abstract something, it can make it less transparent as to what's going on. It can make it harder to debug. It can make it harder to understand. So if you can try to minimize the number of conceptual types of abstraction, that I think that's the key thing to, that really helps there so that you just know that in every API, this is what it looks like. And you know, it's also a case of like stepping away and just thinking carefully about the design space of the problem you're trying to solve. So again, coming back to the data blocks API, for instance, in fast AI version one, it drove me and my users crazy that we had, you know, shitloads of classes for like image regression, image classification, you know, um, image bounding boxes, but like, you know, for every, combination of input and output, you know, which is a multiplicatively large space, you know, we 
we'd have a different class and then somebody would come across some other combination we hadn't supported and we'd build this new thing from scratch. And so, so the Datablocks API actually came from me just going, ah, this is enough. I can't stand this. You know, what are we actually doing in these like thousands of lines of code, which is, you know, in fast AIV one for data processing. And I thought like, oh, there's actually four steps we always do, you know? So it's first of all, like, okay, well, let's pull apart this annoying multiplicative thing and make it possible to say, you know, what's the input type? What's the output type, you know, independent, independent variables. Okay, well, that's gonna then remove most of our classes. And then, yeah, what are the steps you need to do to kind of get your data? It's like, oh, okay, well, you basically, you're gonna start with some data source, like, file names or a network stream or whatever, and then you're going to um, have something that converts that source into independent variables and something that, cut, that converts that source into dependent variables, and then something that splits things into validation and training, and then um, um, something which um, batches it up ready to, you know, be sent to a model. You know, so just like split out each of those things, it's like, okay, well, let's that's our API, you know, that's, that's actually once, so like, uh, you can't always, at least I can't always iterate and refactor my way to a solution. Sometimes it's, you know, actually a case of just stepping back and saying like, okay, well, what are we, what are we really doing here, you know, and, and really designing it thoughtfully. And then often an API falls out of that process. Um, another thing I like doing similar, which um, has been getting increasingly popular in recent years, is what people call documentation-driven programming, which is where I actually write my readme first. And so it's like, okay, let's pretend I wrote the thing I want to write. Let's tell users how to use it. And then it's through that that I kind of think like, oh, shit, there's a whole piece missing here. I told the user you have to do this, and then you have to do that. And like, oh, there's something in the middle. Um, so, you know, that's another way is like write the the readme or the index.html for your documentation for your API to tell, you know, here's how to use it. And often, well, pretty much always I would do that in a notebook, you know, um, and so obviously nothing in that notebook originally works because it's documenting using an API that doesn't exist. But then it's nice I can start to just go through and fill it in gradually piece by piece and have my, have my um, documentation just naturally appear yeah i love anything that involves putting yourself you know as an engineer or as a professional at the start or at the end at the end point and then looking back to what you have to do because that is just it's just such a helpful tactic um otherwise you get bogged down in the details of whatever it is you're doing in the moment and you never really think and you end up in a place you know at the end you're laying all these train tracks and you're like shoot <laughs> i'm 100 miles yeah. from my destination yeah, you know, and it forces you to just write what you need, you know, because mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. I find particularly junior engineers have a real tendency to think about like what's every possible kind of edge case and every possible extension and they'll kind of write this like super abstract thing and then only ever use one tiny piece of it. Um, yeah. So yeah, if you kind of like so I, I only write what I actually need at the time. And I find that that can save a lot of, um, a lot of effort. Now you're making me think about all the code I've written <laughs> and, and <laughs> whether I've, I've, I've done things like that, which I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure we all have. <laughs> um, I guess we all have to, 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 to grow up as programmers. Yeah. Um, yeah. We all have to make the mistakes, you know, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so it feels like the tool, the universe of tools, and again, something we always something we talk about in the in the community on the Slack and in various threads is the universe of tools is expanding, um, and the way those tools are evolving, also they're you know in some senses they're becoming more powerful. You know the same way that you know from you know TensorFlow one to two, it it, it took maybe fewer lines of code to write uh, models, or, or you know from PyTorch original PyTorch to what Fast AI does, it, it took fewer lines. Now we're seeing even more powerful tools like AutoML. Um, and gain popularity both you know I've seen some clinical research papers you know non 
uh, you know, uh, computer science related papers, but they've been using it auto ML more in a corporate environment. Tools like that are, are becoming more popular. You know, from your standpoint of somebody that likes to solve machine learning problems, likes to use the best techniques, how do you see the future of sort of machine learning tooling evolving in, in, in your perspective? Well, I should talk about FastAI's goal, right? So FastAI, um, you know, our organizational goal, as I mentioned, is to um, make deep learning more accessible. Um, now, at the moment, our courses have a prerequisite of at least a year of coding experience. And our key software product is itself a coding library. And the vast majority of the people in the world can't code. So we're clearly failing at our mission. Um, so for me, you know, we're not finished until we get rid of the need to code for the vast majority of people. Just like um, from when I started using the internet, um, you know, it was impossible to use if you couldn't write your own kind of TCP IP config files and you'd have to write a lot of scripts and code and whatever. And nowadays my 81 year old mom uses the internet on her phone every day. So that's kind of where I want to get to. Um, so I, uh, anything which helps us get there is, is great. Um, AutoML has mainly been bullshit. Um, um, you know, I particularly dislike Google's approach to it, and I particularly dislike Jeff Dean's public comments about it, which are about like, oh, we can use a thousand times more compute to get rid of and have a thousand times less data scientists. But like all that Google's auto ML tends to do is like, I don't know, like neural architecture search and stuff like that. And it's like, oh, come on, how many of us have to create our own architectures? You know, it's just marketing bullshit. Um, I will say though, um, the stuff that Abhishek's doing at Hugging Face with Hugging Face Auto ML is different entirely. Like that's that's actually super cool. And um, you know, the difference there is he's somebody who has extensively studied, you know, real world auto ML stuff and he's won international competitions with it and he's like, you know, so with I'm I'm excited about where that's going. That you, you can um, it's not just about hyperparameter sweeps or neural architecture search or something, but it's like genuinely, okay, for an end user with not too much expertise, you can write a single line of code or two lines of code and have it done for you. Um, one thing that's bothered me about AutoML is, is it's often, and again, I'm not particularly including the hugging face one in this, but in general, is it often it, is this kind of lazy thing where people try to throw lots of compute at something where it's just not necessary. So like using AutoML to set your learning rate through some kind of hyperparameter sweep instead of just using the learning rate finder and spending like three seconds and picking the best point, it's just ridiculous, you know? Or like, um, you know, Tra tra checking every possible batch size and learning rate combination rather than just using the simple heuristics we know about to search batch sizes. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff which, you know, the fast AI approach is generally to minimize the amount of compute and data that you need. And so we spend a lot of time coming up with heuristics and rules of thumb and, you know, kind of configurations that work just about all the time. And so we try to, we've always tried to get rid of the need for auto ML. Um, but yeah, I mean, more generally, I think we should be trying to get rid of code entirely. Um, one very interesting thing there, which I still don't know how I feel about it, is uh, Copilot, um, which doesn't get rid of code, but it does write a lot of code for you, um, which is another interesting approach. Um, it writes crappy code for you, 
But like a lot of people who can't code much at all, it's probably better than the code that they'd write themselves. And, you know, I don't know, I guess that's probably a good thing, but I'm not sure. It's, yeah, so stuff like Copilot and AutoML, they're like, they're two-edged swords. And um, I don't, I haven't decided yet whether they're getting us towards the goal of actually making machine learning more accessible or not, but, but perhaps they are. Yeah, I really appreciate the emphasis on a on a big mission that isn't rooted in a in a solution. It's focused on a problem. You know, I think a lot of times people say my my mission is to take this solution and make sure everybody uses it, regardless of the problems that they may be experiencing, right? Um, and you know, your objective kind of feels like okay, deep learning it's pretty useful for those who want to use it. How can anybody who wants to use it, if they feel that you know, that they, that they need it. Um, can you, yeah, say? exactly. And, and, and if the answer is, you know, not using fast AI, but using something else, I'm, I'm thrilled with that. If somebody else solves this problem for us, yeah. then I don't have to solve it anymore. It's like, that's great. <laughs> so I'm always on the lookout for, um, other people doing, doing good work. And I always try to highlight it when I find it because, um, I, was, I don't make any money out of fast AI anyway. I don't, care it's it's there because i want to solve the problem not because not because i want to be the person to solve the problem i just want the bloody problem solved you know yeah that is that is such a good uh you know way of putting it you know um and you know i think definitely the world would be better off if, if we took more of that approach to solving problems generally you know it doesn't matter who as long as it gets done it's um, hard you know because capitalism fundamentally is doesn't work that way you know right. so i only have the privilege That's of being true. able to do that because i've had some successful companies and made some money you know i i wish there was um yeah some different model where where we could all focus on outcomes rather than on winning sure right yeah and you know i think i guess this is kind of related one of the you know you mentioned this idea of throwing compute yeah i'm not going to say i'm the most um I guess you could say tree huggy person on the planet. I have a lot of things I could probably learn on the topic, but it, it does boggle my mind a little bit with the way that compute is, is scaling. Um, and, you know, the publications that are coming out and saying, you know, if you're just going to train every model that you want without thinking about to some degree, the environmental consequences, the, 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 the resources expended are pretty large. It's pretty substantial. And it's something even now as a, you know, as a machine learning engineer myself, I'm like, it, it it is pretty substantial. The the environment. Well, I mean, that's that's always been how it is, you know, and it's always been something I've felt against for you know well over twenty years, um, over twenty five years. Um, so even when I was kind of getting started, all the stuff that people talked about was stuff done on large data sets and large compute, um, because that's what. That's what like people get excited about. Like that's just you know, so the kind of the fundamental algorithmic breakthroughs or, you know, new ideas or whatever, they're not generally the things that get attention. It's the first person to take that idea and throw shitloads of compute and data at it that gets attention because that's where to a lay person they see the obvious benefits, you know. So for example, um, you know, more recently, look at fine-tuned language models, right? So, debatably, you could say we invented general-purpose fine-tuned language models with our ULM fit paper, which, you know, got some interest at the time, but not much. Um, but then when, um, when Alec Radford and the team at um, OpenAI used that exact approach, um, but scaled it up massively, that got shitloads of publicity, you know, GPT was was huge because, I mean, and fair enough, right, because that's where anybody can see what it can do. Um, so yeah, people who throw lots of compute and data at things are always going to get the attention. Also, it always gets the engineering attention because engineers love working with that stuff. I, I actually don't know why because I find it very annoying to deal with kind of big iron compute stuff. There's a lot of like stupid sysadmin stuff to do and DevOps and crap, you know. Um, but 
I don't know. Engineers love working on big machines for some reason. So, um, you know, the rest of us working in the background to actually build the algorithms that all these guys end up using. So be it, you know. I mean, another example would be, you know, the stuff we did with build, with um, developing progressive resizing for the Dawn Bench competition, where we 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 won the, you know, some of the image net categories by using progressive resizing. Basically, nobody noticed um, until Google came along and did efficient net two, which scaled up the idea massively and got state of the art results and blah blah blah. So, yeah, I don't know. It's just the nature of the beast, and it's been that way as long as as long as I've been involved in machine learning. Helpful, helpful reflections. I, I think, you know, I think I see what you're saying when it comes to the engineering, uh, always kind of paying attention to what's big and what's large and, and, and you know, what's, what's gargantuan. And people um, literally put out press releases saying like, yeah. oh, we used, you know, a thousand TPUs and, you know, yeah. 14 terabytes of data and the press is like, wow, they used a thousand TPUs. And it's like, wait, what? that's not a good thing, you know, like if somebody else did exactly the same thing using an abacus, wouldn't that be more impressive, not less? But yeah, I don't know. People love that stuff. Yeah. And the interesting thing there is just in our community is just, you know, I think there is a growing realization. And part of the reasons I think our community is popular is because a lot of people are like, I'm not solving Uber, Google, Pinterest, you know, um, Facebook level problems. You know, a lot of times, you know, a paper or a blog post or something that talks about doing absurdly sized, uh, you know, solutions, it's just not something I have the resources to do. It doesn't solve my problem. Where do I go to find that resource? And that's yeah, no, absolutely. Cool. And the insane thing is people are using Google infrastructure. You know, everybody's flocking <laughs> to like Kubernetes and stuff like this. Um you know, using infrastructure which was designed for problems that are only problems for like five companies in the world. Um, and so I, yeah, I very often will replace a whole, I don't know, kind of Kafka or Kubernetes or whatever thing with like a 10 line Perl script, <laughs> you know, and just like, look what happens when we just throw away all that complexity because we don't, you know, it worries me because th these are the kind of abstractions which I don't think are healthy on the whole, where you create abstractions which are actually full of incredibly complex infrastructure. And if you really need it, then they're great, right? But you don't need it, you know, almost certainly you don't need it. Um, and when you don't need it, but you use it anyway, you know, you now have to pay the cost of that complexity because it, it, it will go wrong. And like, good luck understanding why it went wrong. And good luck knowing, you know, if you've done some misconfiguration causing it to use a hundred times more resources than necessary, how would you even tell, you know? So I really, um, yeah, I really worry about the direction that things have gone in terms of these kind of infrastructure tools uh, that people are using the wrong tools in the wrong way most of the time, in my opinion. Yeah, we've heard horror stories about exactly what you're talking about. I think it's a good segue into what I wasn't sure if we we're going to be able to get into or not, but I feel like we got to go there talking about Jupyter Notebooks and mm -hmm. how divided it makes people when Jupyter Notebooks come up. I know that any time in the community, it, when it comes up, your name is thrown around and either it's your tweets or talks that you've given. I'd love to just take a minute and get the hot take from you about Jupyter Notebooks and, and how you're feeling about them. Sure. Um, well, like I mentioned earlier in, in our discussion, um, I think notebooks are a great environment for exploration and for experimentation. Um, you know, they're also a rich media environment, so that exploration and experimentation 
and communication can include video and pictures and links and all and tables and all that good stuff. Um, I think, um, yeah, I, I, I don't like tools which are scattered all over the place, right? So I would, you know, given I have this nice environment, I would, I would much rather do things once and have them in one place. So um, if I got to write, you know, so notebooks are obviously, I, th I think obviously a, a great place to write documentation because you can actually show the real input and output of, of the code and you can show the plots and you can show the examples and people can, you know, you can turn that into beautiful documentation, but also people can then click a button and actually run it themselves and experiment with it. Um, you know, they're obviously a great place to write tests because tests are all about exploring edge cases and exploring APIs and exploring code. And so as you explore, you're basically writing tests. Um, so yeah, notebooks are very obviously good at doing a lot of the things we want to do when we write code. Um, so then, okay, do you do all this exploration and development in notebooks and then throw the notebooks away and convert everything to PyTest and, you know, um, manually created .py files and Sphinx doc strings and, you know, again, and just adding complexity and creating a, a, a barrier between the work you did to get there and the final artifact, you know, versus just saying, you know what, we can actually just use the notebook directly, you know, to the tests can be in the notebook and the code can be in the notebook and the documentation can be in the notebook. Um, so it's, yeah, I found it um, dramatically more productive and it lets me just create much better quality artifacts. Um, you know, everything's done in one tool. I don't have, you know, a, a thousand different, you know, pieces around like the thing to create my readme and the thing to create my version strings and the thing to create and run my tests and, you know, the blah, 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 uh, the thing to create my documentation. I just have one thing um, and I find that makes my life dramatically easier, particularly because that thing is such a delightful thing to work with. And so then the next question is where people step in and you touched on it is how to put these notebooks into production or do you even put them into production? So you use NBDev. So the answer to all these questions is NBDev. So NBDev is a complete system for doing all the things I've been talking about from notebooks. So NBDev creates um, standard .py Python modules, um, but it creates like best practice ones that do the kinds of things that you couldn't be bothered doing, right? So it creates a done to all to just export the stuff that's actually meant to be public, you know, and it turns your index.html into a readme and it, you know, creates a PyPy module which has the description filled out with your readme contents and it runs your tests for you automatically and it, you know, handles keeping your version strings up to date. Like all that stuff that, you know, if you're doing it manually, you just don't do it because it's too much of a hassle. And if you don't do it manually, you end up with a thousand different tools, you know. So yeah, so use mbdev, you end up with a .py file. And so you've you've built the thing in notebooks, but you're deploying a thing that's just a standard Python module. Speaking of mbdev, I was asking people what kind of questions they wanted us to ask you. And one that came through was, are there any plans for expanding NBDEB library to work better with other kernels, specifically Spark Magic extensions and Apache Livy? Uh, but I'm sure everyone has their own use case. So how do you prioritize? Um, I prioritize based on the needs of, of, of basically my needs, you know, as a Python programmer. Um, and, you know, PRs that we get from the community. So if, if people want to, um, yeah, support other kernels, then I'd be happy to take PRs that, that do so. 
Uh, I am working on NVDev2, which will decouple things quite a bit more. Um, um, you know, version one of NVDev is kind of um, a little bit hacked together just to get something up and running. Um, so I'm going to kind of decouple things a bit more and maybe it'll make it easier to support other kernels. Um, but, you know, yeah, it's not, it's not something I have a pressing need for myself. So that's the kind of thing that probably somebody would have to step up and contribute. And we have a pretty active Discord, by the way, which is a good place. If people are interested, they can pop by and, um, you know, I'm happy to help provide guidance and feedback if people try, try doing that. Yeah, I'm really glad that you brought up NBDev. Makes sense why. And, you know, I think it's something that, you know, the community perhaps we could do. Some people should, we should, we should take a look at it <laughs> and maybe have a thread about that a little bit more because, you know, I do think from my standpoint, you know, notebooks are useful, right? Like that's, that's not a controversial statement. Notebooks are useful. Uh, they may not be useful for everything, but they are useful. And so to be a diva, a little bit about their usage. I find, um, you know, you talk to someone about their experiences, you figure out why they are that way. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I'm not, I don't want to be diametrically opposed to any particular tactic because it may be helpful in a particular setting. And so with that intro, um, because we are the MLOps coffee sessions, I'd love to ask you a little bit about your experiences applying some of the concepts you're talking about with, you know, deep learning, cutting edge sort of software engineering around deep learning packages in company settings. So you've been involved at Kaggle, you've been involved at Analytic, um, and perhaps a number of other startups as well. What has been um, your experience or some of your frustrations with, with um, putting machine learning into production in those environments and how have they shaped your perspective on the development of fast AI and NBDEV? Um. So, yeah, I mean, I spent decades of my life trying to help big companies deploy data-driven decision-making in general, obviously including statistical and ML stuff and also OR operations research stuff. Um, I found that um, nearly all big companies are almost impossible to actually get them to shift to a kind of data-driven culture, you know, and to really effectively use ML and data science in a kind of a deep and central way. Um, because these companies are you know, so I'm talking about kind of legacy companies, so not kind of the Googles and Facebooks of the world, but more the kind of the, you know, GEs or Coca-Colas or, you know, um, shells of the world. Um, you know, they, they, they tend to be um, staffed or, you know, their, their management is generally folks with kind of MBAs, uh, marketing and accounting and legal backgrounds. Um, they, they get promoted there based on their kind of domain expertise. Um, so I kind of like, I spent, I spent a lot of my life trying to help those kinds of companies become more data driven and had a lot of buy-in from senior executives, but I was always unsuccessful. Um, so one of the big insights to me is, um, to focus on startups, um, both creating startups and supporting startups. Um, and so you kind of look at, um, by market cap, the top five companies in America right now are all, you know, startups that were built in my lifetime. Um, and they're all in software, if you include Apple as software, then software plus hardware. Um, yeah, so that's, that's that, you know, and I, I, I find that kind of a bit sad because most of the world's resources are in big companies, but big companies are just yeah, f failing. Um, the other thing I'd say is um, 
I I did you know the the biggest stuff I've deployed was at Optimal Decisions, which was my insurance pricing startup where I was deploying um, systems that literally set insurance prices for the world's biggest insurers. So this is like a you know tr potentially many 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 billion dollar um, question. Um, and so I, I spent a lot of time um, with my team working on simulation, you know, uh, and then also like gradual rollout and very, very careful reporting. And yeah, just like um, it's, um, you know, you're not going to get everything right. You're not going to predict exactly what's going to happen. But if you if you know how to, if you've got a way to roll something out gradually and and carefully track it as you do roll it out, then um, you can do it iteratively. And so that's that's something which I, I don't know. People don't seem to spend a lot of uh, enough time thinking about. We don't have enough kind of stuff to help us with that. But I think that's one of the most fundamental pieces. Yeah. Very interesting answer uh just around the kind of organization that you're working for obviously a part of, of of how successful you'll be but also just i think at the end there you talked a little bit about process and and how important that is and i think one time you know one of the things that you know we've come to realize over the over the course of hosting these coffee sessions and talking to people and in the community is you know process cannot be an impediment to progress and at many organizations it ends up being that because it's really not about, you know, delivering value per se. It's about fulfilling some other organizational objective, whether it is political, whether it is, you know, resource oriented, you know. Uh, and so I think uh, I'm glad that that we were able to get that observation about the organizational uh, challenge at, at, the, at the core of, I guess, MLOps, because it is really something we discuss a lot. Um, and with that nod, you know, I do want to thank you, Jeremy. Uh, for joining us, for taking the time to chat with us, Welcome. so much to learn here. Um, you know what? You know from your software engineering observations uh, to your thoughts on where machine learning tooling will go, and finally uh, a mention of the organizational stuff we love to talk about. Thank you so much for, for for making the time. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, this was awesome, Jeremy. Really appreciate it. And for everyone listening, if you liked it, go ahead, let us know and hit the like button or whatever you do wherever you're listening and throw some questions in there too if you have any we love hearing from you so that's all for today take care folks